So it starts with bowing three times and then reciting the request, Mayang Bhante Tisarnena Saha Atasilana Yachami, etc. Then the three refuges and eight precepts starts on page 133. So you'll flip to the next page. Ah, 
Precepts. Uh, so the eight precepts are uh, renunciant precepts. These are precepts which are common in uh, Theravada Buddhist monasteries, uh, and on rare occasion people also take them as as lay people for extended periods of time. Um, but commonly, it's it's a practice which is done on uh, special days. So the full moons, or sometimes the full moon and the new moon. Uh, in Buddhist countries, people will go to the monastery, and in the morning, they'll take the eight precepts. Uh, and they'll spend the day uh, practicing uh, chanting and meditation, and, um, and sutta study, uh, studying the Buddhist scriptures, listening to Dhamma talks, discussing the Dhamma. So trying to spend the day uh, completely focused on, on practicing the Buddha's teachings. Uh, so this is a, a practice which uh, comes all the way from the time of the Buddha. Uh, this practice of having a, a holy day, uh, once or twice a month, uh, a day when one sets aside all of one's usual worldly uh, preoccupations and activities, uh, and dedicates oneself to, to living a, a bit like a monk for a day. So the eight precepts are, are the backbone of of this practice, this traditional practice of, of taking one uh, holy day, or uh, in Thailand they call it monk day. And so this is the, the monk day, the day when people go to the monastery and act like monks for a day. 
Um, so this is a, a very old tradition. It comes from the time of the Buddha. Um, and uh, the eight precepts are what gives us the basic framework for this. Um, so as Buddhists, of course, we follow the five precepts all the time. You know, so if somebody is really trying to be a very sincere and diligent uh, lay Buddhist practitioner, then uh, they follow the five precepts. So not killing, not stealing, uh, maintaining faithfulness in one's uh, romantic relationships, uh, not telling lies and not using intoxicants, so the basic five precepts. Uh, but then on a day when you want to step up your practice a bit, then you can take the eight precepts. Uh, so with the eight precepts, uh, instead of just being faithful to our partners, we also try to restrain from, uh, refrain from all sexual activity. So to spend a day when we don't fuel our sexual desires at all, where we don't allow sexual desire to control our, our mind or our behaviors. Uh, and uh, one of the reasons for this is because an enlightened being has no sexual desire. An enlightened being is not, not consumed by, by lust or passion. Um, an enlightened being has a, a mind which is always happy and content. It doesn't rely upon any kind of sensual indulgence. So by uh, taking on the practice of celibacy for a day, uh, then we start to get in touch a bit with the mind of the awakened beings. We start to get some affinity uh, with the mind of an awakened being. And realistically, one day is not so difficult. Um, when one day turns into one week, turns into one month, turns into one year, turns into one decade, then, then things can get a little more challenging. Uh, but most people, they can, they can practice celibacy for a day uh, without too much of a struggle. Um, the other major shift from the, the Ordinary Five Precepts, uh, so we have three additional precepts. Uh, so one is the practice of uh, not eating at the wrong time. Uh, so Vekala Bojana means eating at the wrong time, uh, which in Theravada Buddhist tradition is usually interpreted to mean not eating afternoon. So we have uh, some food in the morning, uh, and for most people that's enough. For most people, there's actually no need to eat in the afternoon. Uh, you can get plenty in the morning to sustain you for the rest of the day. And this is actually really wonderful because then for the rest of the day, you don't need to think about food and your body feels very light and fresh. So whenever you eat food, then you feel a little bit sleepy and dull and hazy afterwards, uh, which is not particularly good for spirit, uh, spiritual practice. So we need to eat to survive. We can't get around eating. It's a necessity of life. But what we can do is we can consider how to change our relationship with food so that it doesn't detract from our spiritual practice. We can change our relationship to food so that it becomes a support rather than an obstacle. So one of the ways that we do this is through restraining the frequency uh, and quantity of, of our eating. So eating just the right amount uh, and only eating during one part of the day. Uh, so again, in the Theravada tradition, this is normally uh, only eating in the morning between dawn and noon. Um, in some monasteries, this, this means only one meal a day. They just have one really big brunch somewhere around 9 a.m. or so. Um, but in many monasteries, there's a, a light breakfast and a, a very substantial lunch. Uh, but then after that, you're done for the day. And you can spend the rest of your day practicing meditation and, and studying the Buddhist teachings uh, with a clear mind, a bright mind, an alert mind, a steady mind, a mind which is not afflicted with the dullness and, and drowsiness of the digestive process. This practice is also a, another way that we start to control the, the greediness of the mind. Uh, so similar to how we take on the uh, celibacy practice to help to reduce our, our sensual lust. Uh, in the same way, uh, taking on this practice of only eating at specified times also helps to control our sensual desire. Uh, often when we go to eat something, it's not necessarily because our body desperately needs food, but rather it's just because we're bored uh, or we're craving some kind of excitement or craving some kind of pleasure. 
So it's not necessarily that we need more food, but rather it's that we want something pleasant. Uh, so we go and we find something to eat because we know that's going to give us some pleasant sensations. So with this practice of uh, not eating after noon, then when that craving for, for sensual pleasure arises, we can recognize it for what it is. We can say, oh, well, actually, I don't need to eat. So then what is, this, what is this craving for food? What is this actually all about? And we can look more closely at it and recognize that it actually has nothing to do with nourishment. Uh, it's just about distraction. And it's just about indulgence. It's just about desire. It's about greed. It doesn't have anything to do with actually feeding the body or keeping it healthy. So every morning here at the monastery, right before we eat lunch, uh, we recite a, a short contemplation about food. Uh, so again, this is what the Buddha told us to reflect on before eating. Uh, and it's reflecting that we eat food uh, not for fun, not for pleasure, not for adornment, not for beauty, uh, but only for the health of our body uh, and to sustain our spiritual practice. So a very simple reminder. Why are we eating food in the first place? In order to stay alive and healthy so we can keep, uh, keep up our practice, that's all. Uh, we're not doing it for fun or for pleasure or for intoxication or for uh, making ourselves look pretty. Though um, that can be a side effect, but it's, it's not the main purpose. The main purpose is keeping ourselves alive and healthy so we can keep practicing well. So that also gets us to reflect a little bit on what we're eating and how it's affecting our body. Uh, so if you eat healthy food, um, then your body will feel comfortable and your mind will be bright and alert. Um, but if you survive on, on donuts and pizza, well, you may find that your body doesn't feel so great and your mind doesn't feel so great either. You may find uh, that your mind is a little bit blurry and hazy uh, and you're, you're constantly distracted by the discomfort of your body. Or actually when your body is, is dis, uh, uncomfortable all the time, that can actually lead to a lack of mindfulness. Because you don't want to be present with your body when it feels uncomfortable. So often when our body feels uncomfortable, our tendency is to uh, go into a blurry state of mind, uh, to, to drop our mindfulness so that we don't have to be present for the discomfort. So if you're, if you're eating healthy food, clean food, simple food, nourishing food, then your body will feel, feel light and comfortable and at ease. Uh, and that makes it a little bit easier to be present with your body. Also, you start to become more aware of how different foods affect your state of mind. Um, how some foods will make your mind blurry. Uh, some foods will make you very sleepy. Uh, some foods might uh, excite your sensual desires. Um, some foods might make you grumpy. Um, so keeping an eye on, on how different kinds of foods affect your, your mind, uh, how it affects your emotions, uh, and, and try to, to lean towards, towards foods that have a peaceful, soothing effect on your mind, things that encourage alertness and serenity, uh, things that, that help to uh, support your spiritual practice rather than obstruct it. Um, so this practice of, uh, of not eating afternoon, it means that when that craving for food arises, we can look more closely at it uh, and see it for what it is. Uh, and uh, when we choose not to give in to that craving, then the craving becomes weaker. It has less and less influence on us, less and less control over us. And eventually we can be free of that craving altogether. Uh, it's just a matter of time and practice and persistence. Another aspect of this practice of not eating afternoon is that uh, you will become more familiar with the feeling of hunger. Uh, again, normally whenever we feel hungry, our, our response is to go and eat something to make that feeling go away. So what's going on there? What's going on is that we're having a sensation in the body and we decide that we hate that sensation and we want to obliterate it. So what's going on there? It's aversion, it's hatred, it's hostility. That's not wholesome. Uh, so trying to destroy the sensation of hunger is, is actually not supportive to our practice. It's just fueling our hostility. 
Uh, it's fueling the idea that when we have some, have some experience that we hate, that we should find some way to eliminate that experience. But this state of mind just keeps us spinning around in cycles of, of hatred, cycles of aversion and uh, suppression. So it's not helpful either. Uh, so instead, uh, when the sensation of hunger arises in the evening, which it might, it's not, not uncommon, uh, then you get to observe that sensation and become familiar with it and recognize that fundamentally there's nothing wrong with that sensation. It's perfectly normal. When your body hasn't had any food for 8 or 10 or 12 hours, then it starts sending signals, especially if you're used to eating in the evening then your body will start sending signals that it wants to eat something. Oh, well, that's not surprising. That's the nature of bodies. That's what bodies do. Uh, but it's up to us whether or not to be bothered by that sensation. What does it feel like to be hungry? Well, it's just a sensation. There's nothing inherently wrong there. Uh, we don't need to be disturbed or upset. We can just let it come and go. You know, we, can, we can watch. Uh, it's characteristics. We can watch uh, as it passes through the mind. Uh, and you can get to a point where the sensation of hunger becomes completely irrelevant to you. You can be aware of it, but it doesn't disturb your mind at all. Uh, and uh, in monasteries, normally there's a learning curve of a, a couple weeks or so, sometimes longer. Usually a couple weeks or so of people getting familiar with this practice of not eating afternoon learning the right amount to eat in the morning, the right kinds of things to sustain you for the day, and learning how to become familiar with these sensations of desire and aversion. So desire for uh, the pleasure of eating and aversion towards the discomfort of hunger. Uh, so these two, these two kinds of food-related mm, defilements that can arise in the evening. So learning how to recognize those and not be swept along by them. Yeah, so this, uh, this learning curve, it's kind of usually about a couple weeks, uh, sometimes a bit longer. Um, but then you get to a point where you realize, actually, there's nothing wrong here at all. Uh, these sensations don't need to be a problem. So taking on this practice for one day uh, can actually be a little bit challenging. Uh, but that's good, because challenges are how we grow. Uh, challenges are how we, we make progress on the path. If we only ever do what's simple and easy, then we won't make uh, swift progress. In fact, we, not, we, we might not make progress at all. Uh, so we want to, to challenge ourselves, to push ourselves beyond what we think our limits are. Uh, the truth is our limits are much farther out than we think. Uh, so push ourselves beyond our limits, at least a little bit every day. So that's what the, ultimately what the eight precepts are about. If you're a lay person and you normally follow five precepts, then following the eight precepts for a day, your way of pushing your limits a little bit, asking yourself, can I do this? Uh, can I go for a day without eating afternoon? Can I go for a day without doing anything sexual at all? It's like, oh, actually, I think I can. One day is not too bad. Um, so then the seventh precept, uh, this is one that tends to get a a certain amount of pushback. People really dislike this one, but actually this one's really important. So the seventh precept, uh, it has two parts to it. So the first part, Nacha Gita Vajita Vasugadasana, this means dance, song, music, and uh, shows. So when we take the eight precepts, we make a commitment to try to refrain from uh, entertainment. So dance, either dancing ourselves or watching other people dance. So we try to avoid uh, dancing of any sort. Uh, singing, uh, again, either singing ourselves or listening to other people singing. Uh, music, so we, we try to avoid playing musical instruments and also listening to music. Uh, and shows, uh, we try to avoid watching shows of any sort. So any kind of, of visual entertainment. Um, so whether that's uh, Netflix or endlessly scrolling through Facebook or whatever it is that people do to waste time these days. So we set aside all of that worldly entertainment because we recognize that ultimately all it really does is waste time. 
at best, all it's doing is waste time. But realistically, usually what it's doing is it's generating agitation in the mind. It makes the mind restless and disturbed. It makes the mind unsettled and unpeaceful. Uh, and often it also stirs up um, desire and aversion. Um, you, when you watch, let's say you watch a movie, so then for two hours, what you're doing is you're encouraging your mind to be agitated uh, with the endless flow of, of information and images and ideas. You're encouraging the mind to be agitated. But also you might see uh, many things in that movie which stir up your desires. Uh, maybe images of attractive people or images of, of exciting activities or uh, interesting ideas, uh, things which stir up your desires. And that can linger in the mind for a very long time. A very long time. Uh, sometimes I still get memories of movies that I watched 15 or 20 years ago. So before I was even a monk, um, these things will float back up into the mind. So if these, uh, these things can last for 20 years in the mind, so what's happening if we're doing this every day? If it's an ordinary part of our daily routine, uh, our mind never gets a break. Our mind never gets to know peace. And it's always being constantly stirred up and agitated by all these um, disturbing and enticing imageries. Uh, and the same with aversion. Uh, often when we're watching shows, it triggers our, our aversion, our hostility, our repulsion. Um, which also is not particularly good. It's not, not healthy uh, for our spiritual practice. Um, so we need to really watch. Uh, watch what we're doing with our time and how it's affecting our mind. So if you really desperately want to watch a show, well, watch a documentary about Buddhist monks or something. That's pretty harmless. I can even recommend a couple of good ones. Uh, but even then, that's to be done in moderation. Uh, and not on the opposite of days, if you can. Um, then uh, the second part of this, uh, seventh precepts, the second part is mala ganda vilepana dharana mandana rabusanatana. Uh, so that means not using uh, any kind of uh, jewelry, uh, makeup, perfumes, or anything else that we use to beautify uh, our bodies. So this is about the practice of letting go uh, of vanity. So our, our constant self-obsession with wanting to be attractive and wanting to, to be beautiful and wanting to be appealing to other people or uh, wanting other people to uh, have a good impression of us. Well, what's going on with all that? Well, that's all just self-centeredness, self-conceit, self-importance. Now, ultimately, it doesn't matter the slightest bit. Especially if you're following the third precept, it doesn't really matter whether or not you're attractive, does it? You're not trying to, to get with anyone, so it doesn't matter whether or not anybody else wants to get with you. In fact, it's more convenient if they don't want to get with you. It makes your life a little bit easier. Um, but also, why? Why are, we, why are we so concerned with our appearance? Because we want other people to like us. We want other people to find this appealing or interesting. Uh, well, what's that all about? It's all about me. It's all about our sense of self-importance. Uh, it's all about magnifying our own ego. Uh, so that's uh, the antithesis of Buddhist practice. Buddhist practice is ultimately about uh, eliminating uh, the ego, eliminating our self-attachment, eliminating our self-importance. Uh, so we really want to look at the things that we do uh, to magnify our sense of self-importance. Um, and even considering our clothing. Uh, so often our clothing is, to, uh, is a way of projecting our self-identity, uh, like putting our self-identity on a loudspeaker. Uh, our clothing is a way of communicating to other people um, who we think we are. Um, so often when people come to a, to a Buddhist monastery, they wear very simple, plain, dull clothing. Uh, and that's because there's a recognition that in the monastery we're not trying to look exciting or interesting. Um, we're not trying to communicate our self-identity to other people. Uh, we're recognizing that uh, Buddhism is actually about 
letting go of uh, our self-attachment. Uh, it's about uh, the recognition that self-attachment is what causes us so much misery and suffering in the first place. Uh, and that humility, on the other hand, humility is true happiness. Then the eighth precept, uh, so ucha sayana maha sayana, uh, so ucha literally means lifted up, uh, and maha literally means uh, big or magnificent. Um, so ucha sayana maha sayana means um, exalted and magnificent beds. Uh, so this is referring to the tendency that we have to have these um, excessively lavish and comfortable sleeping places. Um, so then maybe you just want to lounge around in bed more than you really need to, just because it's comfortable and it's enjoyable and it's pleasant. Um, but that's missing the point. Why do we have beds in the first place? Oh, well, it's because you need to sleep. Sleeping is part of survival. Now you need a certain amount of sleep every day. And the exact amount of sleep varies from person to person, and also varies depending upon the conditions in your life. So if you live a very simple, quiet, peaceful life, and you do many hours of meditation every day, then you actually don't need very much sleep. Now you can get by with um, six hours of sleep, even less, five hours of sleep. Um, some people who live um, very simple lives and spend most of their time in meditation, they only need about four hours of sleep a night. Um, this is not the case for most of us, but that's because most of us are, are engaging in other activities. We're engaging in um, conversation and work and, and different um, activities which mm, wear out the mind. They engage and wear out the mind so that we need more rest at night. We're engaging in physical work, which of course also wears out the body, so your body needs more rest. So we need to rest a certain amount, um, but we, not, we want to be careful to, to pay attention, uh, to pay attention that we're resting the amount we need and that we're not just indulging in, in the pleasure of lying down, uh, the pleasure of lounging about on our comfortable beds. So commonly, uh, when people uh, come to, uh, to the monastery to practice with the eight precepts, um, well, if you're just there for the day, you might not be sleeping at all. Um, but if you do go to get some rest, you might just lie down on the floor. Uh, or um, often monasteries have these, these very thin, um, firm mattresses, which are really not particularly comfortable. Um, which means that when you wake up in the morning, you actually just want to get out of bed because it's actually not particularly comfortable to stay in bed. Uh, so the theory is that then you sleep just what you need to sleep and, and nothing more. So these are the, the eight precepts. Uh, so when people come to the monastery to take the eight precepts on the Nuposa today, so like today, uh, commonly uh, people will take these for 24 hours. So from today until tomorrow morning. Um, so keeping the precepts for one day and one night. Um, if you didn't realize that's what you're getting into and you have plans to go to a show with your partner later on and have dinner and so on, well, um, you can make your own determination uh, at a bare minimum to follow the eight precepts while you're at the monastery. Because um, I mean, you have to anyway, and that's, that's one of the monastery rules. Um, but consider, consider how long can I, can I follow these eight precepts for? If you can follow them for a day and a night, uh, so for one full 24-hour uh, period, that's great, that's wonderful. Notice how it affects your mind. Uh, notice what it does. Notice how your mind starts trying to make excuses. This is one of the things that we start to notice, especially if you follow these precepts for a long period of time. You'll notice how the mind is always making excuses. Uh, like, oh, well, we can have fruit juice in the evening, so I might as well just have fruit. And if I'm going to have fruit, well, I might as well have some bread to go with my fruit. And, and before you know it, you're just having dinner again. Like, things degrade very quickly. Uh, so watching that mind, that mind which starts looking for, for excuses, uh, or starts looking for loopholes, or starts trying to justify uh, breaking the precepts and doing something else. 
Uh, the mind was just like, well, I'm just a little bit bored. I'll just watch this one show, and it's only half an hour, and, and then I'll get back to my practice. And, and of course, one show turns into two, turns into four, and your whole day is gone. So this is, this is the tendency of things. Uh, when we start getting wrapped up in indulgence, then the mind can very, very quickly slip into these addictive cycles. So really watching that mind, watching that mind which keeps looking for excuses uh, to step around these precepts. Um, and recognize how unnecessary it is. Uh, again, if you're not used to following the eight precepts, it can seem like a huge hassle. It can seem like a huge uh, renunciation. It might seem like you're letting go of a lot. But if you're used to these precepts, then you know that there's nothing, there's nothing serious here. I've been living by these precepts for many, many, many years. Uh, so it becomes second nature. It's just like, well, of course I'm not going to eat dinner. Why would I? I don't need to. I mean, it's quite possible to overeat just having breakfast and lunch. And I actually have no idea how people manage to eat so much, so many times during a day. Like, what are you doing? But usually after lunch is over, like the thought of eating in a few more hours is just unthinkable. Like, I don't know how people, they have lunch, and then they have an afternoon snack, and then they have pre-dinner snack, and then they have dinner, and then they have post-dinner snack, and then they have late evening snack. And like, how do people do this? How are they constantly cramming food into their stomach? It doesn't make any sense to me. But that's because I've been following the eight precepts for a very long time. So just, like, why would you do anything else? So... Uh, another important aspect that you posted today is, of course, uh, meditation practice. Uh, so I think at this time we can go ahead and, and do some meditation. Um, so you can get in a uh, meditation posture. Uh, if, you've, if you're feeling a little uncomfortable from sitting for the, the talk all this time, um, then you can stand up and stretch a little bit if you need to.